Okay, so if you have a Bible, why don't you turn to uh, 2 Timothy, which is where I'm going to be reading from. It's the last Sunday in the month, and so um, we had the all-age service reflecting a little bit on Timothy's example earlier this morning, um, and I just want to reflect on 2 Timothy chapter 4, which is a passage that we had uh, during the course of this week. If you're doing our Bible reading plan, you'll know this is kind of where we're, where we're up to at the moment. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 1 through to 8, and Paul writes the following. It says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great, great patience and careful instruction. For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations." Endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. It's God's word to us this morning, and maybe it's the romantic in me, um, but I kind of picture Paul sitting in his accommodation, um, either writing or dictating a letter to an assistant and, and that sort of thing, and, and he's got pulled around him this rather threadbare coat uh, that he's, or cloak that he's kind of pulled around him and that sort of thing. And he's thinking in his head, he's thinking, oh, note to self, I must remind Timothy to tell Carpus to give him my coat so he can bring it to me when he comes and, and visits and that sort of thing. And I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's because it's autumn now that I think maybe it's autumn when, when Paul is writing this letter. So there, there's that chill that creeps in. It gets warm during midday, but in the evening and in the morning, it's just a little bit cold. And he's, he's pulling this rather threadbare cloak around him to ward off, ward off the chill because maybe there's a chill in the air. Maybe it's not the chill of the weather. Maybe it's the chill of abandonment and loneliness. There are faithful people that have been standing alongside him, faithful people that have been serving alongside him who are now opposed to him and against him and against the faith. Uh, maybe it's the chill of knowing that actually the race has come to an end. You know, if you know the, the kind of how things flow and that sort of thing for Paul, he's, he's been in prison, then he was released for a little while, and then when he's writing this letter to Timothy, he's actually been put back in prison again. And as he thinks about being put back in prison again, he's like, this time, this time it's it. You know, my, my time is up now. And so as he writes to Timothy there, he says, the, the, you know, I've, I've run the race. I've kept the faith. And then I love what he says next. You know, there is a crown of righteousness in store for me. You know, pay close attention to what it is that he's saying there. He's not saying, I hope there's a crown of righteousness in store for me. Oh, please let there be a crown of righteousness in store for me. I think maybe just kind of I might squeak through and there might be a crown of righteousness in store for me. You know, he says with absolute certainty, there is a crown of righteousness that awaits me. There's an absolute certainty in his voice. There's an absolute confidence in what it is that he has to say. There is a crown of righteousness in store for me. It's a confidence that I, I kind of think as you read this passage, it's a confidence that flows from, from who God is, from who Christ Jesus is, and the grace that Jesus has poured into Paul's life as he set him apart for a particular purpose, for a, with, with, with a particular vision, with a particular purpose, and with a particular charge. And if you've read your scriptures and that sort of thing, you'll know what this is, right? We find it in Acts chapter 9 when... Uh, we read the story about Paul on his way to go and persecute the church in Damascus, and he's on the road, and he meets the risen Lord Jesus, and he uh, falls to the ground, and he, he gets blinded, and eventually gets led to that house on Straight Street. Do you remember the story? right? And as he's at the house on Straight Street, he's, he's fasting and praying for, for three days, and at the end of it, the Lord sends Ananias. 
And Ananias comes to, to Saul, who becomes Paul, and he comes to him, and the Lord has said to Ananias, this man is my chosen instrument who will carry my name to the Gentiles, to their kings, and to all of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. This is the, the vision, the, the, the purpose, the charge that Paul had. This was the thing that got him up in the morning, the thing that kept him going, even though he was being kicked from pillar to post. It just he woke up, I think he woke up each morning and thinking, you know, once more into the breach, because I've got this, I've got this thing that the risen Lord Jesus has laid on my heart, and I need to be a witness to his name. I need to tell people of his name to the Gentiles, to their kings, and so on. And it's a vision and a and a purpose and a a charge that he carried with him again and again, every single day, drawing him once more to, to, to press on to fulfill this task. And he gets to the end of his journey, and he's like, I finished the race. He's looking back on his life, and he's, he's looking at the, the road that he's traveled in his life. He's looking back, and he's saying, do you know what? I've, I've finished this race. I've kept the faith. I didn't turn to the left or the right. No matter how difficult it got, I didn't turn to the left or the right. I kept the faith. I finished the race. I've I've completed the task, and so he's filled with this confidence. And as I was reflecting on this passage during the course of this week and that sort of thing, I wonder if his example should not inspire us to do the same. There's a sense that what Paul has been doing throughout his life is he's, he knows what it is that he's supposed to be about, and he's been attending to that vision, that purpose, that charge. He hasn't let it slip from his mind or anything. He's been keeping it in the center of his heart and his mind. This is what I'm to be about. And then by the grace of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit, he's actually finished the job that God gave him to do. He's done that which he's supposed to do. And I wonder as he writes this, one, is he not giving us an example and urging Timothy to do the same thing? You know, just to capture it in a simple phrase, in a simple sentence, I think the central message is this, attend to your vision. Attend to your vision. That's what a former Archbishop of Canterbury writes and encourages his readers when he writes the following. He, he says to them, are you looking into your vision? Are you looking into your vision? Are you letting yourself be shaped and changed by what you see? I'm asking, in fact, about the precise degree to which your vision is for you, what you live by day by day, a matter of life and death, sense and nonsense. Are you attending to your vision? Are you stripping yourself in prayer and before the terrible and searching word of God? Are you being refined in that fire? And am I? Is my vision doing that to me, breaking and remaking my thoughts, my words, my heart, my mind? I have no right to destroy your vision, nor you mine. I have no business to devalue your understanding or make light of your struggles, nor you mine. But we have the right and perhaps the duty to put the question to each other and hear from each other, are you attending to your vision? Are you paying attention to the thing that God has called you to? And, you know, as soon as we begin to kind of think about this, it, it, it works in two ways, right? And that this word lands with us individually as followers of Jesus this morning, but it also lands with us corporately as a church. Individually, this word lands with us and says, to you as an individual person, are you attending to your purpose? Are you attending to the charge that God has given you? Is it stirring you? Is it inspiring you? Is it getting you up in the morning? Can you remember what it is? Does it have a verse that undergirds it that you meditate upon? And, and then for us if individually, that's for us individually, but then corporately, I think this passage stirs us as a church and asks us as a church, are we, are we attending to our vision? A vision that we adopted together as a, a church last year at June, captured in the four Ps. Do you remember it? The prophecy, the promise that beckons us forward, our priorities, the reason that we exist, our purpose, the things we do, our pursuits, the lifestyle we actively seek. Are we attending to these things? Do, you know, do we know that our priority as a faith family is to be a place to grow? Are you praying into these things? And so you prayed into it as such that actually now it's committed to memory and it's moved from memory to your heart. And so it's not just something that you know and go, huh, yeah, okay, but actually it's moved to your heart. So now it's shaping your life. 
And it leaves you to a sense filled with a holy discontent if things just remain the same, if things don't necessarily change. If we don't go from one degree of glory to another, that, that should fill us with a holy discontent. If we fully captured the vision that we have together as a church, it should, it should stir something within us. It should move us inwardly. Are, are you attending to your vision? Are you attending to our vision that we share together as a church? Are you pausing and thinking about it from time to time? I'm sure Timothy would have. You know, as he gets part to this part of the letter, this deeply personal letter that he that he gets from Paul, he, you know, I'm sure that he he, he just pauses and he, he begins to think. You know, verse chapter four, verse one. He, he reads there and he's like, "I give you this charge." That's what Paul's saying to him. I give you this charge. I'm giving you this purpose. I'm giving you this vision. It's a task to complete, a duty to uphold, a responsibility to carry. If you think in pictures, then perhaps think about the story that Jesus told. Remember the one about the master that goes away on a journey and he gives to his servants a sum of money? Do you remember this one? Yeah, and he calls his servants in and he gives them each a sum of money and he says, I want you to take this and I want you to put it to use in the marketplace and when I come back, we're going to see where we are, right? And what has he done there? What has the master done? He's given to each of the servants a vision, a purpose, a charge, a task. It's a responsibility to carry. It's a duty to fulfill. And in the same sense, Paul is saying to Timothy, he's saying to him, Timothy, here, as, I'm come, as my life is drawing to an end, let me tell you what's on my heart, Timothy. This is the charge. This is the purpose. This is the responsibility that you need to fulfill. This is what you need to be about. This is what you need to make sure gets you up in the morning, because if you do that, Timothy, when you get to the end, you, like me, will be able to say, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, there's a crown of righteousness in store for me. And, and by the way, Timothy, I'm not always going to be there looking over your shoulder. I'm not always going to be there breathing over your shoulder to check out that you're actually doing that which you're supposed to be doing. But just in case you think you're on your own, no, no, God the Father is going to be there, and God the Son is going to be there, and they're going to judge the living and the dead, and They are the ones who are establishing their kingdom, and they are the ones that ultimately you will have to give account to. So in front of them, with them as witnesses, Timothy, here's the vision I'm giving you. Here's the purpose I want you to be about. This is the charge I'm giving you. Here's your responsibility. This is the task you need to fulfill. It's so simple. It's so memorable. It's so transportable. Preach the word. Preach the word. Pretty loaded statement, right? Have you heard people say this before? Have you ever pressed people to ask them, what do you mean when you say preach the word? Have you ever done that before? Because this word gets thrown around and and sort of that sort of thing. Oh, all you need to do is preach the word, brother or sister. All you need to do is is, is preach the word. You know, in in every circumstance, just, just preach the word. But when you actually get down to it and you press people and you ask them, what do you mean when you say preach the word? They're a little bit like, uh, which part of the word exactly? Mm, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I'm not really kind of sure and that sort of thing. And, and it's almost as if, as if Paul is anticipating that Timothy's going to have questions. So Timothy's read this and he's like, oh, okay, so I need to be about preaching the word. But he's like, uh, which part? <laughs> and remember, the scriptures for Timothy would have been the Old Testament, right? So he's like, which part of those 39 books do I need to be about? You know, wh- what is he talking about? Exactly. And it's almost as if Paul anticipates this. And so in writing, after he said to Timothy, preach the word, there's probably a hyphen or colon in your thing, and then follows a few little bits of instruction. And you could look at it like this. It's the when, it's the what, it's the how and the why of preach the word. Paul said to him, here's your charge. This is what you need to be about. You need to preach the word. But Timothy, just so that we're clear, here's the when, here's the what, here's the how, here's the why, the when of preach the word is this, in season and out of season, Timothy. In season and out of season. When the opportunity seems favorable, Timothy, and when the opportunity doesn't seem favorable. Whether it's convenient for you, Timothy, or not. Whether it's welcome or not. This is when you need to preach the word. But you and I know, right? In order for that to happen, you've got to be prepared. Right, if you're going to be prepared in se- it's easy to be pre- it's easy to preach the word in season because you're prepared for it. But out of season, when you've been stuck in traffic and the kids have driven you crazy first thing in the morning, 
right? And somebody comes up to you as you come into work, and they're like, hey, I was just thinking, man, can, can you give me a reason for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus? And you're like, you don't know the morning I've had, you know? Let me tell you about my problems for a moment, all right? Be prepared in an, an out of season. You, it requires preparation. It means that daily we've got to be immersing ourselves in God's Word. Daily, Timothy has got to be abiding with Christ Jesus in prayer. Daily, Timothy has got to be absorbed with Jesus in worship. Daily, Timothy has got to be pouring his heart out to serve other people. It, it doesn't just come like that. If we, Timothy is going to be prepared in and out of season. He's going to have to, if he's going to be ready in and out of season to preach the word, he's going to have to be prepared. So that's the when. The question comes then, what is the what? The what of preach the word. And Paul mentions these different things. He says, correct and challenge those who err in the fundamentals, correct and challenge, basically, those who err in the fundamentals of faith and in their behavior. Rebuke and warn those who perhaps are caught in sin. Encourage and earn those who are growing to maturity. And do you know how this is best done? I don't think it's by bashing people over the head with particular Bible verses. You know, being the Bible police and that sort of thing. I think the way that this best is best done is literally to preach the Word. I don't know if you noticed in your Bible, it's a capital W, right? right? It's not a small W, it's a capital W. The Greek word is logos, as in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. He was with God in the beginning. So in, in a sense, what, what Paul is basically saying to Timothy here is, that, listen, if, you, if you're going to correct and challenge, rebuke and warn, encourage and urge, here's what you need to do. Just unveil Jesus. Preach the word. Literally, preach Jesus. Unveil Jesus. Tell people about His majesty. Tell people about His power. Tell people about the fact that He's the one for whom and through whom all things have been created, and He's the one that sustains all things. Tell people that He is the King of the entire universe, the one that alone deserves our allegiance and our worship. Tell people that He is the Savior of the world, that there is no other way to be reconciled to God other than through faith in Jesus Christ. Unveil Jesus. Pull back the curtain so people can see His beauty. Pull back the curtain so people will see His majesty. Pull back the curtain so that people will see His worth. Unveil his humanity. That though so far above us, as we were talking about last week, he's become like us. He's been made just like us. He knows what it is to be tempted in every way, and yet he has remained without sin, and therefore is the only one who was qualified to offer his perfect life as an atoning sacrifice. And in our place to bear our sin, and in our place to bear our shame so that we wouldn't have to so that a way could be opened that ordinary sinful people like you and me might be reconciled to God. Hey, Timothy, when you preach the word, unveil Jesus. You know, when we do it that way, when, we, when we're not sort of bashing people over the head with verses and, and being Bible police and, and, and that sort of thing, it's the kindness of God then that leads people to repentance. I remember I grew up in a church where all I heard about was a very angry God who was out to get me for the bad things that I had done. That's what I grew up with. And it's when I started coming to this church, and I remember sitting right about where Violet's sitting over there at, at the moment. And I began to hear week after week a message of grace, and it was the message of grace that God loves you, He is for you, He wants a relationship with you. That's what melted my heart. It was Stuart Woodward standing here week after week, unveiling Jesus again and again and again. That's what broke my heart and drew me in. Timothy, and unveil Jesus, reveal Jesus, Let preach the word, do it like it, just tell people about Jesus, and, and, and how? Well, Timothy, you're going to need to do it with great patience, you're going to need to do it with great patience, but don't quit, keep at it, keep it simple, keep it faithful, one step at a time, one day at a time, and, and why, Timothy? You've got the when, you've got the what, you've got the how and, and the why of preach the word, Timothy. Because the time is coming, I guess we could say, in the days that we're living in, a time has now come. When people will chase after spiritual junk food and sound bites rather than put up with sound doctrine. 
They'll turn away to, from the truth to godless myths and start following and hashtagging all their favorite teachers on social media who say what their itching ears want to hear. But, but not you, Timothy. This is what Paul is saying. But not you, Timothy. Make sure that you attend to your vision, your purpose, and this charge. It's going to get a little bit hairy from time to time, Timothy. All right? It's not going to be easy every day. But you, you keep your head in all situations. Keep your eye on what you're doing. Stay calm. Stay cool. Keep steady. Take the rough with the smooth. And keep revealing Jesus. And make sure you do a thorough job of revealing Jesus. And in this way, you will discharge all the duties of your ministry. And I think that as Timothy gets to the end of this, he, he, he puts the letter down, then he picks it up and he reads it again. You know how you ever do this, where something's really important, right? You put it down, you pick it up, you put it down, you pick it up. He puts it down, he picks it up, and he's like, I need to pay attention to this. And he puts it down, and he picks it up again. He like, puts it down. Then he goes and makes a cup of tea, and he comes back, and he reads it again. And it's just immersing himself in this, committing it to memory so that it finds a landing place in his heart so ultimately it will transform his life. And from everything that I can read in the New Testament, from all the things that you can pick out about Timothy, I think he lived this out. I think he too would have been able to say with Paul, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, I've completed the task, there is a crown of righteousness in store for me. You, you read the stuff that Paul says about Timothy in some of his other letters, and you just get the sense that here is somebody who knew what he was supposed to be about, and he was doing it by the grace of God, with the power of the Spirit at work within him. So not in his own strength and, and that sort of thing, but by the grace of God and by the power of God, he was actually living it, living it out. Just go and read Philippians chapter 2, verse 15 onwards thereabouts. You just get a picture of the kind of man that he was becoming. But what about you this morning? What about us this morning? I mean, if we go to Scripture together, what is, the, what is the vision? What is the charge? What is the purpose that has been given to the church of Jesus Christ that all of us share in common? We'll get specific in a moment, but that all of us share in common. We, we, we should know what it is because it's kind of captured in our priorities, right? We're, we're a place to grow. And that's drawn out of Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 28. Do you remember the story? The risen Lord Jesus is standing on the mountain. All his disciples have gathered to him. There's about 500 people that are there. Some are worshiping him. Others are doubting. And then he says to them famous words, which may be underlined in your Bible. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end. Of the age, And in that simple little story, in that simple little episode, everything that the church is supposed to be about, everything that a follower of Jesus is supposed to be about, is captured. You could sum it out in, in three little things, three little legs that make a stool stand properly and stand secure. Number one, we're supposed to be about worship. The vision, the purpose, that we char the charge that we have as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be a community of faith who worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. We're supposed to be a community of faith that are just so captivated by his majesty, captivated by his splendor, that, that the idea of not gathering on a Sunday would just seem crazy to us. Now, I know worship is, is, is all of life, right? But th this is the crowning moment. This is where we come from our scattered places and our everyday normal places, and we get to stand together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we get to declare the praise of Him who has called us out of darkness into His glorious light. And when you encourage one another in, in worship and say, draw near to God, we were singing it, come let us worship our King. Let, let's allow the vision of the King Jesus to fill our hearts and fill our minds that as we move out from this place again, that which we've encountered here, we might go live in our everyday normal place. We're to be about worship. We're to be about, number two, we're to, we're to be about discipleship. And Jesus says to his followers, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Do you know what the primary thing is? The primary command is love one another. 
saying to his disciples, hey, go out there and teach people how to love one another. It's there in John chapter 14, verse 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so must you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciple. Now, I imagine the disciples, that when they heard Jesus say that for the first time, they were like, that's not new. <laughs> that's not new. We know that. We know that from the Old Testament. Well, they're scriptures, right? It's the first and second commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's not new. Oh, it is new. It is new because Jesus has moved the benchmark, right? Before, he's been saying, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There are some people that don't really love themselves, and so therefore are incapable of loving their neighbor. But Jesus is saying, hey, as I have loved you, as I have loved you, so must you go and love other people. And you think about the kind of love that Jesus has for you. It's, it's patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not rude. It's not proud. It's not selfish, doesn't keep a record of wrongs, it perseveres, it trusts, it hopes, it never fails. Hey, just think for a second with me. What would it look like in your everyday normal place, what would it look like in church if people loved one another in that way? Instead of being self-focused, we're other-focused. Instead of per pursuing their agenda, pursued God's agenda. What would it look like? I mean, worst case scenario, people would be blessed, right? Worst case scenario, if you loved like that in your everyday normal place and in church, it would mean that other people would be blessed through your life. Best case scenario, by this, all people will know that you are my disciple. Your life will be an, an apologetic about the truth of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? In that way, we'd be salt. In that way, we'd be light. What I was talking about earlier on this morning. Worship, discipleship, mission. We're a sent people. The thing that we're collectively to be about is that we are a sent people. Jesus said, therefore, go. Right? And, and, and some scholars, I think, rightly point this out, that the, the form of the original word is, is go. So not what we've often done in churches and that sort of thing, which is to say to people, come. You know, come to the thing we're doing here at church. Come to this activity. Come here. We, we want you to draw you in. And actually, the passage is actually saying, no, go. As you go, wherever you go, whenever you go, make disciples. Talk about Jesus. Make much of Jesus. Model godly behavior. Make good work. Be a minister of grace and love. Mold the culture around you instead of being molded by it. Be a mouthpiece for truth and justice. Be a messenger of the gospel, right? So, and if you think about those three things, mission, discipleship, and, and worship, that's what we're about as a church. When we talk about being a place to grow, if you, if you know it right, you, you will know that this captures this. We're a place to grow in encountering Jesus, worship. We're a place to grow in living for and following Jesus, discipleship. We're a place to grow in making space to lead people to Jesus' mission. It, it all flows from here. But do you carry it? Do we carry it? Together do we carry it? Are we praying, God, help us in this? Are you attending to that corporate vision? And then to bring it down personally to you, are you attending to the vision and charge that God has given you? The thing that God has placed upon your heart. The thing that makes your heart... Do you know what it is? I know what mine is. It's lifted right out of Colossians chapter, chapter 1. Something that has been in my heart since the moment that I was called to ministry. Proclaim Jesus. Warn and instruct everyone about Jesus with wisdom. My goal is to help people to grow in their faith so that one day they would stand mature in Christ Jesus. Every ounce of talent and gifting and strength that God has given me is bent towards this. Don't grow weary. Work in the strength that God has provided. Struggle to this end with the help of the Spirit that powerfully works in you. This is why I get up in the morning.
this is what I attend to. But what about you? What is the picture that God has placed on your heart that breaks your heart? What is the thing, the one thing that you do and do it well? And no matter what happens, you just keep going and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going because the voice of God about that one thing is louder than every single other voice that might come about. And so you press on and you press on. Do you know what it is? Every single person here who is a follower of Jesus, a born-again, blood-bought believer in Christ, every single one of you have a gift something that God has placed in your life to use in service of the church so that the body of Christ can be built up and that sort of thing. Are you doing it? Are you using the gift in church and in your everyday normal place? Do you have it fixed in your mind? What is the vision, the purpose and charge that Christ Jesus has given to you? The worship team come up and we prepare to respond to this word. You know, as you think about this vision, purpose, and charge, it, it's only you that can fill in the blank. And if you're drawing a blank, then maybe this morning you need to seek God. We're living stones being built into a spiritual temple. We're parts of the body where every part does its work. All of us should have this kind of thing in our heart that burns, that we want to be about and will not be deflected from. What, 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 is, what is the thing that drives you? What is the vision that you need to attend to? Perhaps this morning, what is the atten- a vision that you need to ask God the Holy Spirit to breathe back into life this morning?